I work in the oil and gas business. This is not a particularly popular industry today, considering what you read about and how our business potentially impacts the planet. I didn't grow up in this industry, but this is the only industry I've known as an adult. I grew up in a small South Texas town where I graduated with 28 people. I worked on a farm by the hour went to university, and got my chemical engineering degree. And the reason why I chose chemical engineering because it was the highest paid undergraduate degree that I could get at that university. And my first job in the field, I worked my way up to the office and into a leadership role and ultimately became the president of a Fortune 100 company. Is, is working in the oil and gas business, especially as a CEO with my name on the door, is this my life's purpose? We know today that the burning of fossil fuels, which is coal, oil, and natural gas, by 7.8 billion people, is contributing to CO2 in the atmosphere. That CO2 causes the earth to warm. In the last 170 years, the earth has warmed about one degree Celsius. A warming earth, combined with melting polar ice caps, has caused oceans to rise about eight inches in the last hundred years. Many scientists report that extreme weather events are here today and are only gonna get worse. So increased flooding, increased droughts, which contributes to wildfires. This year alone, there's been over three and a half million acres of wildfires in the US alone. Knowing all of this makes it uncomfortable to be an oil and gas executive. Institutions and banks that used to invest in companies like ours no longer invest in us. They lump us into categories with alcohol, tobacco, firearms, pornography, and now fossil fuels. This has caused me some shame. I remember walking into the first Conscious Capitalism CEO Summit. I told Rand they're going to look at me like I'm a child molester <laughs> walking into a Conscious Capitalism guy as an oil and gas executive. You know, and, and even though I felt that shame, I, I've already done my research. I know that today is the best time to be alive in human history. Life expectancy on the planet today is 73 years. 120 years ago, it was half that, mostly due to dropping infant mortality. We dropped 89% in infant mortality back then only two children, or two children out of five, would die before their fifth birthday. That doesn't happen today. GDP has been on an exponential climb for the last 120 years. How do we know that? One of the indicators is education. Today, 86% of people over the age of 15 can read and write. Only 21% of people 20, 120 years ago could read and write. So how are both of these truths possible? The earth is warming, climate is changing, but humans are flourishing. Well, it's access and use of energy. We figured out through decades of innovation to create machines and find the energy to feed the machines that gives us our quality of life. We replace horses with tractors, cars, and trucks. We replace water pails with water pumps. We replace you know, shovels with digging machines. You, you get the idea. It's been a miracle of human ingenuity and persistence to get to the quality of life that we live today. Unfortunately, not everybody on the planet has access to those machines or the energy it takes to feed those machines. There's no such thing as a low energy, high income country. Countries that use more energy have higher GDPs cleaner water, cleaner air, more forest, higher education levels. Bill Gates is one American that has studied this issue. The Bill and Melinda Gates 
foundation has tackled some of humanity's biggest problems, like polio, malaria, access to sanitation, extreme poverty. And those of you that follow Bill Gates, you know, he's an extreme reader. His favorite author is Vaclav Smil. He says, I wait for new Smil books like some people wait for the next Star Wars movie. And the reason why he likes Vaclav Smil so much is he's probably the leading thinker and author on energy in the, on the planet. He's written over 40 books, over 500 papers. One of the books that I really enjoyed reading that talks about the evolution of energy in human history was Energy uh, and Civilization. It has a quote in there, a decoupling of economic growth and energy consumption during early stages of modern economic development would defy the laws of thermodynamics. He ties economic growth and energy consumption together. Let me give you an example of how this works. This is a Caribbean island. On the left is Haiti, on the right is the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic is the same island, same people, about the same population, much different. The Dominican Republic uses fossil fuels for their energy source, like most of the developed world. Haiti uses wood and dung as their energy source. As you can see, Haiti's deforested. The GDP of Dominican Republic is nine times higher than Haiti. Longer life expectancy, lower infant mortality. At nighttime in Haiti, it's like it's stepping back a hundred years. This, in my opinion, is the largest problem we're facing as humanity. This is energy poverty. The UN Sustainable Development Goal for no poverty cannot be met without understanding energy first. But how does the UN define poverty? That's those that live on less than $1.90 a day, just like the Haitians. How does the US federal government define poverty? Those that live, live on less than $12,800 a year, which is $35 a day. That's a big difference between the two. But here's the number to remember. 46% of our planet lives on 550 a day or less. Now, to get from 550 a day closer to $35 a day is going to take a lot of energy. As we continue to raise people out of poverty, it's going to take a lot of energy. It's good to understand where our energy comes from today. For all of human history, our energy came from our environment, wood, dung, that sort of thing. In 1800, right in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, coal showed up as a more dense energy form, but in a very minor way. By 1900, we had doubled the world's population. Coal was a more major source of energy, but wood is still the major source of energy. At that time, we added some energy sources. We added crude oil, natural gas, hydro. Today, we added more energy sources. We added nuclear, we added wind, we added solar. But the thing to notice, most of the energy we use on the planet comes from wood and fossil fuels. Over 85% of the energy you use is from that. And I know what people could be thinking right now is that wind, solar, and nuclear are taking over. That's just for electricity. Only 18% of the energy you use in your life is for electricity. The vast majority of energy that you use is for transportation, agriculture, and industrial uses. So there is an energy evolution going on. Each of these pie charts is to scale. Today it takes a lot more energy than it did 200 years ago. And as we add more sources of energy, their percentages change over time. But the reality is we never stop using one form of energy before we start using another form of energy. Even after 200 years of innovation, we use more wood today for energy than we ever have. Over 2 billion people on the planet use wood and dung as their primary energy source. We call it biomass. Each energy source that we add is increasingly more difficult to use. It's more expensive 
and it relies on the one before it, and there's trade-offs to different energy sources. The cost and access of energy in Nigeria is different than Nebraska, is different than Nicaragua. And in the next 30 years, we're going to need 50% more energy. Where's it going to come from? History would tell us exactly where it's coming from now, except for it's going to be in different percentages and different quantums. So the moral dilemma we're faced with is, do we want to deliver more energy to people to keep helping people out of poverty and help them adapt to climate change? Or do, do we want to restrict energy to people, keep them in poverty, and hope to change the climate? Because energy use equals human flourishing, we have to put idealistic views in check while sticking to the laws of thermodynamics. I believe we should be pro-energy, pro-climate, and anti-poverty. I think this is pro-human. So in 2018, I took a stand. Instead of leaving the company I'm with, to work on this issue, I started the work of transforming Howard Energy Partners to meet this challenge. We'd been financially successful up to this point, but we were institutionally immature, and we got to work professionalizing the company. We defined our purpose and core values. We started quarterly town hall meetings. We developed our first strategic imperatives and initiatives. We put our top 20 leaders to the Stegen ILP. We upgraded our ESG program to attract investors and banks. We started weekly and monthly management rhythms. We totally redeveloped our, our website and branding. We started a new ventures group to work on lower carbon forms of energy. This was a major multi-year effort, and it was working. The feedback we were getting, our employee engagement was the largest one-year increase that our consultant has ever seen in employee engagement. They said, whatever you're doing, identify that and keep doing that. Our ESG scores, which are rated by a worldwide firm to compare us against other infrastructure energy companies in the world, rated us in the top quartile. I was being asked to speak at our investors' ESG conferences. And financial results, during the pandemic, we broke our previous EBITDA record. It really showed the resilience of our, of our employees and our assets. We were taking our company from the standard build and, build and flip orientation to a platform to be used for long-term value creation to help humanity flourish. Howard Energy is helping Mexico transition off of dirtier coal and fuel oil to natural gas through our pipelines in South Texas and Northern Mexico. We're building the first renewable diesel logistics facility in Texas. Renewable diesel is made from animal fats and recycled vegetable oil. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 80%. Our hydrogen production facility is on track to be the lowest carbon-intensive hydrogen production facility in the Texas Gulf Coast. And we have many other projects in the pipeline to keep delivering energy to people in cleaner ways. And we're just one in the oil and gas business doing exactly this. We deliver the vast majority of energy that the world uses to continue to help bring people out of poverty. Energy use is thermodynamically tied to human flourishing. And we have a long way to go. But I'm confident in rooms like this, if we're willing to have honest dialogue and continue to evolve our energy sources, billions of people will have the chance to live the quality of life that we get to live. Thank you for having me.